Memoirs of the Life of the Reverend William C. Burns, Chapter 4, 1839, Revival Scenes. The subject of the revival of religion, as the great want of the times, had been already, and for a long time, much in the minds both of the pastor and the people of Kilsley. That's K-I-L-S-Y-T-H. The memorable scenes of the year 1742-1743 when under the ministry of the Reverend James Robe, that's R-O-B-E, this parish shared with that of Cambus Ling, in so remarkable an infusion of the Spirit of Christ, still lived as a cherished tradition in the hearts of the people, and there were still here and there little companies of praying souls, who spake one to another of the good days of the past, and who sighed and cried, over the subsequent times of de declination and backsliding. There was, I believe, at least one society for religious fellowship, which had survived in the uninterrupted succession of its members all through the intervening period, and whose lamp of faith and prayer was still found faintly burning when the light of a new morning broke upon them and the whole parish seemed to awaken uh, as from a dream of a hundred years. Into those sacred remnants and aspirations my father entered most profoundly from the first day of his ministry here in 1821 and labored unceasingly thenceforward to keep them alive both in his own heart and in those of his people. In the words of his biography, his public instructions as well as private conversation and visitations and elsewhere abounded with allusions to those happy days of the past and with expressions of ardent longing for their return. And to this point might the whole course of his ministry be set more or less to term. In 1822, the second year of his ministry, we find him, along with another congenial spirit, the humble and godly Dr. George Wright of Sterling, bending over the old records of the Kirk Session bearing on the dates 1742 to 1749, and with solemn interest, deciphering the dim, dim and fainting lines that refer to the incidents of the work as then in progress. Towards the close of the same year, December 1822, on two successive Sabbaths, he preached directly and fully on the subject, taking for his text those singular, appropriate, and impressive words in Micah 7.1. Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the grape gleaning of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit, bringing the whole case of past attainment and subsequent declination before the congregation, and calling upon them again to arise and seek the Lord. In 1830, in consequence of some unusual outbreaks of sin, in connection with drunken brawls, a, peri a, a day of fasting and prayer in the view of prevailing sins and backsliding was appointed by the Kirk Session and observed that marked so seriousness and solemnity. In 1832, the near approach of the cholera, which fell heavily on the neighboring village of Kirk in Tilwalk, but never actually entered Kilsley while sound, sounding its own terrible peal, at the same time summoned the pastor to lift up his voice in another earnest call to repentancy and newness of life. In 1836, we read an elaborate essay before a clerical society in Glasgow with a twofold object of calling more extensive attention to the subject and of drawing forth the suggestions of his brethren in regard to some signs of awakening life which were even then appearing in his own parish. About the same time, he sought by means of brief but pointed pastoral addresses to families, heads of the families and on family worship, which he printed and presented to every household in his parish to revive the spirit of personal and family re uh, religion among his people. Finally, on a Sabbath afternoon on August 1838, standing on the grave of his reverend, revered predecessor, Mr. Rowe, on the anniversary of his death, and taking as his text the words inscribed in Hebrew letters on his tomb, 
Isaiah 26, verse 19. He pled before a vast assembly of his people in behalf of Christ in the new birth unto eternal life in tones of unaccustomed earnestness and which stirred the hearts of many in a manner never to be forgotten. By such means as these did he seek the, through successive years to strengthen the things that remained and were ready to die. And if so it be, so it might be, fan the fable spark once more into a flame. The result was seen in a glowing, heighting tone of moral and religious life in the congregation and parish generally, as well as laterly in more specific tokens of the divine power and presence, which seemed the precursors of increase of seriousness and devout earnestness in public worship. Prayer meetings became at once more numerous and more fervent. One or two sermons at communion times, marked by a peculiar unction and power, had fallen with visible, solemnizing effect on the congregation. One in particular, by the Reverend A. N. Somerville of Anderson, Glasgow, on the words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, which imprinted itself on many hearts and was afterwards often referred to as marking an error in the religious history of the parish. Conversions, in fine, of a more than usual striking kind, became more frequent and contributed at once to arrest the attention of the careless and to animate the hopes and quicken the prayers of those who were looking and longing for the heavenly shower. Meanwhile, influences of a concurrent kind were at work elsewhere and tended still further to quicken the pulse of religious life in the place. Similar tokens of reviving earnestness were appearing more or less extensively among the members of the other Christian denominations around, and particularly in connection with a small but very fervent society of Wesleyan Methodists, whose distinctive teaching tended greatly to emphasize in the minds of the people the great ideas of conversion, the new birth, and the conscious peace and life of God, and whose unwearied activity and zeal for the gathering in of souls spread by happy infection to the hearts of others. It was in these circumstances and to a field thus prepared that the young evangelist now came, bearing the precious seed which he had already sown with such hopeful promise in Dundee. The remarkable scene which followed has been already often described, and I should have almost shrink from attempting any fresh account of it, did there not happily survive a full and deliberate statement from my brother's own hand, which will enable us to survey it from a new and deeply interesting point of view. It was written during a quiet interval in the Mansi of uh, Kielsef, exactly a year after the occurrence to which it refers, and is couched in a tone of solemn thoughtfulness and utter self-abnegation in the presence of him whose wondrous works he records, which imparts a peculiar weight of every word in the impression of which would be marred only, not helped, by any labored description of ours. Having a spare hour, it has occurred into my mind that it may be for the glory of God that I should at last record my recollections of the marvelous commencement of the Lord's glorious work in this place on the month of July, 1839, and I entreat the special aid of the Holy Ghost that I may write according to his own will and for the divine gl glory regarding these wonders of the Lord Jehovah. During the first four months of my ministry, which were spent at Dundee, I enjoyed much of the Lord's presence in my own soul, and I laid in large stores of divine knowledge in preparing from week to week for my pulpit services in St. Peter's Church. But though I endeavored to speak the truth fully and to press it earnestly into, on the souls of the people, there was still a defect in my preaching at that time, which I have since learned to correct, viz., that partly from unbelieving doubts regarding the truth in all its infinite magnitude, and partly from a tendency to shrink back, from speaking in such a way as visibly and generally to alarm the people, I never came, as it were, to throw down the gullet to the enemy by the unreserved declaration and urgent application of the divine testimony regarding the state of fallen man and the necessity of an unreserved surrender to the Lord Jesus in all his offices in order that he may be saved. However, I was gradually a 
approaching to this point, which I had had in my eye as the grand means of success of converting souls from the first time I entered the pulpit, and even from the day of my own remarkable conversion, on which I trust the Lord may enable me to leave some record behind on this earth for the glory of his own infinite sovereign and everlasting love in Christ. During the last three Sabbaths, I was at Dundee before coming to Kilsworth. I was led in a great measure to preach without writing, not because I neglected to study, but in order that I might study and pray for a longer time. And in preaching on the subjects which I had thus prepared, I was more than usually sensible of the divine support. The people also seemed to feel more deeply solemnized than I was told of some who were shedding silent tears under the word of the Lord. I was to have preached on the evening of the fast day at Kilsworth, July 18th, but the burial of my dear brother-in-law, George Moody, Moody, at Parsley was fixed for that day, and I was, of course, obliged to be present thereat. His death was accompanied with a blessing from Jehovah to my soul. I never enjoyed, I think, sweeter realizations of the glory and love of Jesus and of the certainty and blessedness of his eternal kingdom. Then when at Parsley, on the, this solemn occasion, the beautiful, consistent, and holy walk of our dear departed brother, with the sweet, divine serenity that marked the closing scenes of his life, made his death very affecting and eminently fitted to draw away the heart of the believer after him to Jesus in the heavenly glory. This was, in effect, on my soul through the Lord's power. On the way to the grave I wept with joy, and could have praised the Lord aloud for his love in allowing me to assist in carrying to the bed of rest a member of his own body, of his flesh and of his bones. And when I looked for the last time on the coffin body, in its narrow, low, solitary, cold resting place, I had a glorious anticipation of the second coming of the Lord, when he would himself raise up in glory everlasting that dear body, which he has appointed us to bury in its corruption and decay. I have taken this retrospect of circumstances in my own history previous to the time of my coming to Kilsworth as they bore very powerfully upon my own state of mind and were among the means by which the Lord finished my preparation a preparation which he had begun even in my infancy, for being employed as his poor and despised but yet honored instrument in beginning and in assisting to carry on the wonderful work that followed. I was appointed to preach at Kilsa from Friday evening. I did so from Psalms 130, verses 1 and 2, a subject I had lately handled in Dundee after studying Owen's three theses on this Psalms. I believe I preached with considerable solemnity and in a manner in some degree fitted to alarm unconverted sinners and sleeping saints. I remember that some of the people of God seemed to respond with great fullness of heart to many of my petitions in public, in public prayer, that while I was preaching there was a deep solemnity upon the audience, and that some of the Lord's people met me as I retired apparently much affected and testifying that the Lord had been among them. On Saturday, I preached at Banton from Psalms 130, verse 3, with considerable assistance, as far as I can recollect. My uncle, Dr. Burns of Parsley, seemed to feel that if the Lord was with me, and kindly asked me to take his place at Kilsworth on Sabbath evening, leaving him to fill mine on Monday forenoon, he spoke also. I remember, in the family of its not be in my duty to go abroad as I was on the eve of doing, but that I should be a home missionary in Scotland. I myself did not speculate anxiously about the future, but desired to be an instrument of advancing his work at the present time. In the evening of Saturday, I met with one or two persons under deep distress of soul, and one of these, who is now a consistent follower of Jesus, seemed to enter into the peace of God while I was praying with her. This brought the work of the Spirit before me in a most remarkable and glorious form that I had before witnessed it, and served at once to quicken my desires after, and encourage my anticipations of seeing some glorious manifestation of the Lord's saving grace. On Sabbath evening went on, as usual, until the conclusion of the third table service, 
if I remember right, when Dr. Burns kindly shortened his own address and introduced me to the people, that I might give a short address not only to the communicants, but to all present in the church. I had no precise subject in view on which to speak, but when rising to was led to John 20, if I mistake not, simply by its opening to me and appearing suitable. This subject I try to generalize as displaying the experience of the saint in seeking communion with Jesus, and in the manner in which Jesus often deals with such. I had much assistance and was especially enabled to charge hundreds of the communicants with betraying Christ at his table. I heard afterwards of some that were much moved at this time, and in particular of one woman who was then first apprehended by the Spirit and has been to all appearance converted. In the evening I preached from Matthew 11:28, but as far as I can recollect, without remarkable assistance or remarkable effects. At the close, however, I felt such a yearning of heart over the pe poor people among whom I had spent so much of my youthful years in sin, that I imitated I would again address them before bidding them farewell. It might be never to meet again on earth, and that I would do so in the marketplace, in order to reach the many who absenced themselves from the house of God, and after whom I long in the bowels of the Lord Jesus. This meeting was fixed for Tuesday at 10 a.m., as I intended that day to leave Kilsliff on my return to Dundee. On Monday evening we had a meeting at the Society, Missionary Society. Dr. Burns preached an excellent sermon from Isaiah 52, verse 1, in which some things were said upon Christ's wedding garment which touched my heart. In speaking, I felt the case of the heathen lying nearer in my heart than I think ever before or since, and was enabled through, though without any previous idea of what I was to say, to speak with liberty and power of the Holy Ghost. This and all other similar facts I would testify as in the sight of Jehovah, and as being obliged to do so for his glory. May he enable me to give the glory all to him, and take none of it at all, to my own cursed flesh. The people seemed much impressed. The meeting, however, was not very large. I can hardly recall the feelings with which I went to preach on Tuesday morning, a morning fixed with all eternity in Jehovah's counsels as an era in the history of redemption. May the Holy Ghost breathe upon my soul and revive to, in my memory two faithless, alas, to the records of the Lord's wondrous works, the recollection of the marvelous scene, which was then displayed before the wondering eyes of many favored sinners in this place. Though I cannot speak with precision of the frame of soul in which I went to the Lord's work on that memorable day, yet I remember in general that I had an intense longing for the conversions of souls and the glory of Emmanuel that I mourned under a sense of an awful state of sinners without Christ. Their guilt in rejecting him is freely offered to their acceptance my own total inability to help them by anything that I could do and my complete unfitness and unworthiness to be an instrument in the hands of the Holy Ghost in saving their souls, while at the same time my eyes were fixed on the Lord as the God of salvation with the sweet hope of His glorious appearing. I have since heard that some of the people of God in Kilsleth who had been longing and wrestling for a time of refreshing from the Lord's presence and who had been and who had during much of the previous night been travailing in birth for souls, came to the meeting not only with the hope but with the well nigh the certain anticipation of God's glorious appearing from the impressions that had had upon my own souls of Jehovah's approaching glory and majesty, especially when pleading at his footstool. The morning proved very unfavorable for our assembling in an open air, and this seemed to have been a wise provincial arrangement. For while on the one hand it was necessary for our meeting should be imitated for the open air in order to collect the great multitude, on the other hand it was very needful in order to the right management of so glorious a work as that which followed that we should be assembled within doors. At ten o'clock I went down to the middle of the town and with some others drove up before us some stragglers who were remaining behind the crowd. When I entered the pulpit, I saw before me an immense multitude from the town and neighboring neighborhood filling the seats, stairs, passages, and porches, all 
in their ordinary clothes and including many of the most demanding of our population. I began, I think, by singing the 102nd Psalms and was affected deeply when in reading it I came to these lines. Her time for favor was now set. Behold, is now come to an end. The word now touched my heart as with divine power and encouraged the secret hope that the set time was really now at hand. I read without comment, but with solemn feelings, the accounts of the conversion of the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and on this account I am told affected some of the people considerably. When we had prayed a second time, especially imploring that the Lord would open on us the windows of heaven, I preached from the words, Psalms 110, verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. This subject I had studied and preached on at Dundee without any remarkable effect. And though I was so much enlarged on this occasion in discoursing from it, I have not been able to treat it in the same manner or in, with the same effects at any subsequent time. The following was the plan of the remarks which I was led to make upon the words, I, the, number one, the persons spoken of, they are God's elect, those given to Christ of the Father. Number two, the promise of the Father to Emmanuel regarding these persons, they shall be willing. One, willing to be saved by Christ's righteousness alone. Two, willing to take on his yoke. Three, willing to bear his cross. Number three, the time of the promise, the day of Emmanuel's power. Number one, it is the day of his exaltation at the Father's right hand. Verse one, in example, the latter day. Number two, it is the day of free preaching of the divine word. Number three, it is the day in which Christ crucified is the center and sum of the doctrine taught. Number four, it is the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord shall send, etc. I was led under this last particular to allude to some of the most remarkable outpourings of the Spirit that have been granted to the church, beginning with, from, beginning from the day of Pentecost, and in surviving this galaxy of divine wonders, I had come to notice the glorious revelation of Jehovah's right hand, which was given at the Kirk of S-H-O-T-T-S in 1630, while John Livingstone was preaching from Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, when it pleased the sovereign God of grace to make bare his holy arm in the midst of us, and to perform a work in many souls resembling that of which I had been speaking in majesty and glory. In referring to this wonderful work of the Spirit, I mentioned the fact that when Mr. Livingstone was on the point of closing his discourse, a few drops of rain began to fall, and that when the people began to put on their coverings, he asked them if they had any shelter from the drops of divine wrath, and was thus led to enlarge for nearly another hour in exhorting them to flee to Christ with so much of the power of God that about 500 persons was converted. And just when I was speaking on the occasion and the na nature of this wonderful address, I felt my own soul moved in a manner so remarkable that I was led, like Mr. Livingstone, so to plead with the unconverted before, before he instantly to close with God's offer of mercy and continue to do so until the power of the Lord Jesus became so mighty upon their souls as to carry all before it like the rushing mighty wind of Pentecost. During the whole of the time that I was speaking, the people listened with the most riveted and solemn attention, and with many silent tears and inward groanings of the Spirit. But at the last their feelings became too strong for all ordinary restraints, and broke forth simultaneously in weeping and wailing, tears and groanings, intermingled with shouts of joy and praise from some of the people of God. The appearance of a great part of the people from the pulpit gave me an awfully vivid picture of the state of the ungodly in the day of Christ's coming to judgment. Some were screaming out in agony. Others, and among those strong men, fell to the ground as if they had been dead. And some with the general commotion that after re repeating for some time the same free and urgent invitation of the Lord to sinners as Isaiah 55, Revelations 22:17, I was obliged to give out a psalms which was so joined in by a considerable number of voices being mingled with the mourning groans of many prisoners sighing for deliverance. After Dr. Burns and my father had spoken for a little and prayed, the meeting was closed at 3 o'clock, invitations having been given that we might meet again at 6. 
to my own astonishment before the uh, progress of this wonderful scene, when almost all present was overpowered, it pleased the Lord to keep my soul perfectly calm, along with the awful and affecting realization which I obtained of the state of the unconverted, I had such a view of the glory redounding to God and the blessings conferred on poor sinners by the work that was advancing as to fill my soul with tranquil joy and praise. Indeed, I was so composed that when the view of the recruiting my strength for the labor is still in view, I stretched myself on my bed on going home. I enjoyed an hour of the most refreshing sleep and rose as vigorous in mind and body as before. I have now before me the notes from my own manuscript of the sermon, the delivery of which was productive of so remarkable an effect that it may well be conceived that in this case the written word conveyed but a very inadequate impression of the spoken address to which they scarcely bore a greater resemblance than the black glistening fuel to the live coal glowing with bright furnished heat. His manner, indeed, at first and, and through nearly one half of the discourse, was as usual, but there was about him throughout an awful slum of days that his soul was overshadowed with the very presence of him in whose name he spoke, and as he went on, the presence seems more and more to pass. After results and in everything except the miraculous gift of tongues, it seems to me to have been exact counterpart. It is his manner indeed at first, and through nearly one half of the discourse was, as usual, calm, deliberate, measured, nor did he, I think, greatly diverge either in words or in sequence of thought from the line of the written discourse, but there was about him throughout an awful solemnity as his soul was overshadowed with the great presence of him in whose name he spoke, and as he went on, that presence seemed more and more to pass within him and to possess him and to bear him along in a current of strong emotion, which was alike to himself and to his hearers irresistible. Appeal followed appeal in every increasing fever and terrible energy, till at last, as he reached the climax of his argument and vehemently urged his hearers to fight the battle that they might win the eternal praise, the words, no cross, no crown, peeled from his lips, not so much like a sentence of ordinary speech as a shout in the thick of battle. Another moment of intense and uncontrollable emotion I vividly remember, and urging sinners to an immediate closing with Christ and the offer of his grace. He had made use of the obvious and very common figure of a lifeboat bringing hope and deliverance to the side of a floundering vessel. When in delivering the idea and dwelling on it, the whole scene seemed to pass in living reality before his eyes. The doom, bark, rolling, helpless amongst the wild waves and the rapidly settling down. The crouching, trembling throne, clinging to the gun wall and the life buoyant uh, skiff, leaping up towards them amidst the blinding spray so near that they might almost touch it as he saw them, still hastening and wasting in fatal inaction the last moments of the of opportunity. He cried aloud, as one might do, from the summit of a neighboring headlong on the shore, Are you in? Are you in? Flee for re refuge. To lay hold of the hope set before you, now or never. There was in his whole style and manner at this moment, as frequently out afterwards at similar times, a dramatic vividness and energy which reminded one of what we read of in Whitfield, a vividness and energy, however, which in my brother's case was not in any measure due to a graphic um, poetic fancy, but simply to an earnest and awful realization of eternal truths. As to the scene itself which followed, I can think of no better description than the account of the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of the Acts, of which both in its immediate features and in, in, in its after results, and in everything except the miraculous gift of tongues, it seems to me have been an exact counterpart. It is from this time that we must date a remarkable change in my brother's manner of preaching, which Mr. Moody Stewart has described in a manner so admirable that I am tempted to transcribe his words. At Kilsleth there was fulfilled in him the promise, The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom he delight in. 
For weeks before he was full of prayer, he seemed to care for nothing but to pray. In the daytime, alone and with others, it was his chief delight. In the night watches, he might be overheard praying aloud. Yet during this time, the power that rested upon himself did not affect his preaching. It was sensible, clear, orthodox, unobjectable. And in that, indeed, he never altered, for in the midst of whatever excitement, there was never any eccentricities or extravagances of doctrine or even the extreme pressing of any one point, but a steadfast keeping within lines of received truth, as not expecting conversion by any special way of stating the gospel, but by the power of the Spirit accompanying it. For a season, however, before the close of com communion, he seemed to different men in private and public, his own spiritual strength so far exceeding what appeared in the pulpit. But then the Lord, who had strengthened David to slay the lion and the bear in the recesses of the mountains, sent him forth to triumph over Goliath before the host of Israel. He had been asking, seeking, knocking for the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit came upon him with all power, and the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved, multitudes, both of men and women. The movement thus began in a manner so remarkable, went on steadily, and for weeks thereafter seemed only to grow in, in solidity and depth. Meaning, meetings for prayer and preaching of the gospel were held every successive night, generally in the church and occasionally when the weather favored in the marketplace or in the churchyard. Crowds of inquirers flocked at every invitation to the vestry or the mansi to seek spiritual counsel from the minister and from his assistants. Prayer meetings, both of the old and young, sprang up everywhere in the village and the surrounding hamlets. The neighboring extension church of uh, Bantam erected to, uh, through my father's ex excursion a short time before, and then uh, under the pastoral care of Reverend John Lyon, now of uh, Wathody Ferry, before the scene of a similar work of awakening and spiritual blessing. Ministers from all parts of the country, and especially from the neighboring city of Glasgow, came to the help of the overtasked pastor, and greatly contributed by the richness and variety of the instructions to impart stability and spiritual subsidence to a movement which might otherwise have largely evaporated in mere excitement. The mountain glen, the solitary hue, even the noisy lamp shot, loom shot, became vocal often with the sounds of prayer and praise, or witnessed the solemn conversion, conversion of the brother who had even time talked with burning hearts of the things that had come to pass in those days. The whole tone and spirit of the place seemed for the moment changed, and an air almost savagate brooded over them, which strangers recognized as with instant reverence they approached the spot. In the words of a statement read at the time by the minister of the parish to the presbytery of the bounds, the waiting of our young and older people at the close of each meeting and at the anxious asking of so many what to do, the lively singing of the praises of God, which every visitor remarks the complete um, dis desuetance of swearing and of the false talking in our streets, the order and solemnity at all hours prevailing, the voice of praise and prayer almost in every house, the cessation of the turmoils of the people, the consignment of the flames of volumes of infidelity and impurity, the coming together of divine worship of such a magnitude of our population day after day, the large catalog of new in intending communicants giving in their names and conversing in the most interesting manner on the most important subjects. Not a few of the old careless sinners and frozen um, formalists awakened and made alive to God. The conversion of several poor uh, colonists who have come to me and given the most satisfactory account of their change of mind and heart are truly wonderful proofs of a most surprising and delightful revival. The public houses, the coal pits, the harvest reaping fields, the weaving loomsteads, the recesses of the glens and subsequent haunts around all may be called to witness that there is a mighty change in this place for the better. The subject of the memoir had been obliged to leave a few days after the commencement of the remarkable scene just described in order to resume his duties at Dundee, where his work was becoming every day more interesting. Uh, but on the 21st of September, he was again accused of taking part uh, in the services of a second communion, which the new birth of so many souls and the fresh baptism and, and 
abounding joy of others had rendered necessary. It was a season long to be remembered alike with the solemnity and sacred sweetness of its services and for the rich token and blessing which both accompanied and followed it. To use again the grave words of the pastor, having then proceeded accompanied and followed by a very unusual copiousness of prayer, the showers in answer were very copious and refreshing. We are daily hearing of great of good done to strangers who came. Zacharias liked to see what it was who had been pierced in their heart and had gone away new men. Our own people of Christian spirit have been greatly enlivened and strengthened, and some have hopeful cases of apparently real beginnings of new life have been brought to our knowledge. I feel grateful to the God of grace and God of order in, in the churches that there have been a concurrency of what is true, venerable, pure, just, lovely, and of good report, and that little indeed has escaped from any of us which can just, justly cause regret. The solemn approach, the solemn appearance of the communion tables, the delightful manner in which they were exhorted, the presence of not a few unusually young disciples at the table, the seriousness of aspect in all, the memoirs of the life of the Reverend William C. Burns. This is chapter 4, part 2, pick up on page 71. The solemn appearance of the communion tables and the delightful manner in which they were exhorted, the presence of not a few unusually young disciples at the table, the seriousness of aspect in all, and the softening and melting look of others, made upon every rightly disposed witness a very delightful impression. For ninety years, doubtless, there has not been in this parish such a season of prayer and holy communions and conferences, nor at any period such a number of precious sermons delivered. The spiritual awakenings and genuine conversions at this time are not few, and it is hoped will come forth to victory. But the annuals of eternity only will divulge the whole. At this time, and at this point, my brother's personal journal, which the exciting absorbing labors of the last month had almost wholly interrupted, became again available, and I gladly returned to it, as furnishing at once the most authentic and the most impressive account both of the work in which he was engaged in and the part which he himself bore in it. Saturday, 21st September, 1839. I stayed at Mr. Guthrie's, that's G-U-T-H-R-I-E. Footnote. The Reverend Dr. Thomas, and it's called G-U-T-H-R-I-E, then of St. Paul's Parish, afterwards of St. John's Free Church, Edinburgh. End of the footnote. All night, all night, and started at 7 a.m. by the boat for Kill Sit. The boat was nearly filled in the cabin by dear brothers and sisters of Christ going to the communion at Kilsit. We had much blessed converse together and engaged twice in prayer and once in praise. We arrived at a quarter to one and found that I was expected to officiate at half past two o'clock. I accordingly preached in about a thousand about Romans 10.4, with much assistance. On Sabbath, after Mr. Rose had preached at the tent, I was called on to follow him, and, and accordingly preached for about two hours from Isaiah 54, verse 5, to a congregation, which, according to a calculation founded on the extent of the ground which it occupied, is thought to have been little short of 10,000. They were very solemn and attentive, hardly one removing during the sermon, and though I did not notice many other visible impressions, I was told that not a few were in tears, young men as well as others. After leaving the tent, I went to the communion table, which was addressed in a most interesting way, upon the love of Christ by Mr. Rose. I did not, however, experience much near communion with my blessed Lord and Savior, but had to complain of much blindness and deadness, while my soul was not altogether unmoved, through his free and infinite love. After Dr. Dewar, Dewar, uh, footnote, principal of M-A-R-I-S-C-H-A-L College, Aberdeen, Mr. Middleton of Straff Meagle, and Mr. Somerville had preached at the tent. 
I was called again to preach the evening service there at 7 o'clock, while Mr. Rose did so in the church. The subject was Isaiah 54, verse 10, The mountains shall depart, etc. And I was so much assisted both in exposition and exhortation, that there was visible among the people a far greater awakening than during any part of the day. We continued together till between 9 and 10, the moon being full and the sky unclouded. Though the mist began to settle in the hollow, in which the tent was placed. After we had gone home, my father and Mr. Rose, not having yet come in, it struck me, while at tea, that we ought to have a meeting still in the church, and continue all night in prayer to God for the outpouring of the Spirit. Some objected, but Charles Brown was completely on my side, saying that he was put in mind, on that occasion on which the friends of Jesus sought to lay hold of him, saying, He is beside himself. And accordingly we again repaired to the church, where many were already assembled, joining in prayer with Mr. Barton of Bathgate and Mr. Middleton. And after the bell had been rung and the church was filled, Charles J. Brown sang and spoke upon a part of Psalms 72 and then prayed. When he had concluded, Mr. Martin spoke on Psalms 14 to those still unawakened and engaged in prayer, according to to concert specially for the same class. Mr. Somerville then addressed the awakened, but not yet converted, from the account of the conversion of Saul, and afterwards prayed for them as Mr. Martin had before done for the others. I was then called in conclusion to speak more generally to all, and did so considerable length and very calmly from the first four verses of the 116th Psalms, which, having been sung, the whole was concluded with prayer. We separated from this most precious meeting, in which not a few were awakened. At 3, 3 a.m. on Monday, and after leaving the church, Mr. Somerville and I were forced to remain in the session house with the distressed instructing and praying till between 5 and 6 o'clock when we went home to rest. The cases in the session house were numerous and very interesting. September 23rd, having risen from a refreshing sleep, at twelve noon, I was told that I was expected to preach the second sermon about two at the tent. I was counseled by my mother to be aware of harsh expressions in preaching and prayer, and told by Jay that she thought there was a danger of my losing the former sweetness, as she said, of my manner in preaching for an unseasoned sternness. I thank the Lord for this counsel, and was told by her afterwards that I had been enabled to correct the fault. There were an immense number of ministers and preachers at the tent on Monday, and I went down under some anxiety, as I had no special preparation. However, I was enabled in private and public prayer to cast myself on the Lord, and He did not prove a wilderness to me, a land of darkness, but aided me beyond all my expectations. The text from which I spoke was Ezekiel 36, verse 26. A new heart will I, give, will I also give you. And I found so much laid to my hand, both in expounding and applying the subject, that I could hardly get done. There was great attention among the audience, which might amount to two thousand, and, blessed be God, some of the ministers present seemed to be convinced that the Lord had helped me to be faithful. Charles J. Brown and John Duncan spoke particularly in this way. In the evening, Charles J. Brown preached a most excellent discourse in the church at eight o'clock, from the words in Matthew, What do ye more than others? Showing first, why Christians might be expected to do more than others, and second, what more they were expected to do. After he had concluded, I felt deeply impressed with the desirableness of continuing in prayer to God, especially with and for the unconverted, whom we were, alas, to leave at the close of this blessed season farther in many cases from Jesus than before. I accordingly proposed to Charles J. Brown that I should ask the unconverted to stay behind, not excluding others who might also desire to do so. He said I should do as I thought best, and accordingly, after the praise was ended, I asked those who knew that they were still unconverted to remain, coming down to the front rows below to be addressed and prayed for. By thus assigning them particular seats, rather alarmed and staggered Mr. Brown, and as I afterwards found, my father also and many of the ministers present, but as no remonstration was at the time made, and after so many had come forward that the seats were fully occupied, and even a young gentleman from Glasgow, 
whom I had been conversing with a little before under considerable concern about his soul, and went into them with the younger brother also much affected. As I noticed during the sermon when the love of Christ was spoken of, Mr. Brown's doubts appeared to vanquish, and I proceeded after singing and long continued prayer to exhort at great length those in the seats and also the congregation at large to an immediate closing with Christ. In this work I was assisted, I think, as much as ever before in my life, having a degree of tenderness and affection which my hard, hard heart is rarely privileged to feel. And in prayer I was favored with peculiar nearness to God, insomuch that at one time I felt as if really in contact with the Divine Presence, and could hardly go on. While at the same blessed season there seemed to be a general and sweet melting of heart among the audience, and many of the unconverted were weeping bitterly aloud, though I spoke throughout with perfect calmness and solemnity. We separated between one and two o'clock, from this the last, and I think without doubt, the most eminently blessed part of the whole communion season, at least in as far as I was a witness to it. After the meeting had broken up, many went to the season house, where my father had been with not a few in distress during the greater part of the meeting. And then he and Mr. Rose continued for several hours longer, witnessing, as they told us when they came home, the most wonderful displays of the Holy Spirit's work. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The rest of the history, so far as it can be written or read, in this world is soon told. The high spirit tide of exalted feeling necessarily mingled more or less with a mere sympathetic excitement gradually passed away, and the current to like of religious ex experience and of ordinary human life flowed once more in their customary channels. There were some temporary professors, there were some imperfect conversions, there were some whose bright early promise, though not wholly darkened, did not shine forth with an altogether unclouded luster more and more into the perfect day. But there were very many to whose shining consistency and purity and steadfast deliverance to the end declared plainly that they had been with Jesus, and that in that terrible moment of their soul's agony they had been indeed born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The history of Kilsleth revival, in short, as of every other true revival, whether ushered in by the earthquake and the world went, or by the still small voice, had in truth been written eighteen hundred years before by him who knoweth the end of the beginning. Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon the stony places, where they had not much earth, and wherewith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into the good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. End of chapter 4.